it recorded. Ah. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Well, let's give, let's, let's wait maybe another minute or so, and then we will um, get started. Okay. little Quaker silence. <laughs> I know, I'm not good with these silences. For Episcopalians. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I will get started. I am Sarah Cowan. I am the president or chair, uh, whichever you prefer, of the trustees of the diocese. And we feel it's very important to reach out to parishes and others that have um, funds that are invested in the diocesan unit trust uh, to um, give you an update, allow you an opportunity to hear from our investment advisors, uh, as well as ask any questions that you may have for those of you that are here. Uh, and for those who may be listening to the recording, we also encourage you to reach out uh, either to one of us um, who are trustees um, or, um, or however you want to try to reach out to us and ask questions in the future. Uh, it's been a uh, interesting year, as we all know. And so I would like to make sure that we have plenty of time for um, our investment advisors to walk us through uh, what has happened in the past year or so. Uh, in the meantime, though, I'm going to hand it over to Ellen McCullough Lovell, who is the chair of the investment committee for the trustees. Uh, and the other members of the committee are also with us, David Bullock, Chris Chapman, and Paul Horn, our treasurer, also is with us this evening. Um, but uh, I will hand it over to you, Ellen. Thank you. I think we're a small enough group to do really brief introductions, and I'm just basically looking for who you are and um, your church affiliation. Um, investment advisors, that's not necessary for you. <laughs> um, and um, I'm Ellen McCulloch Lovell. As Sarah said, I chair the investment committee of the trustees of the diocese and um, recently co chaired the Thrive uh, group that made recommendations that I'm happy to say the convention just passed. Um, and I worship at Christ Church Montpelier. David? Uh, I'm David Bullock. I've been a trustee for the last couple of years. Uh, I worship at St. Mark's in Newport. I've had uh, 45, 50 years of investment experience and happy to take any questions. I run a small advisory firm of my own and uh, very happy to be with you tonight. Thank you, David. Uh, Chris, another member of our committee. <clears throat> Hi, um, my name is Chris Chapman. I'm <clears throat> with the uh, St. Michael's Episcopal Church in Brattleboro, where I worship regularly. Turns out that's where my parents met, too, years ago, and were married. <laughs> um, that's a, that's I, a real home church. <laughs> that's a home, yes, I'm a real homie. Um, <clears throat> so I've been on the trustee board for a number of years. I think it's five. I've kind of lost count because uh, our terms are long, about seven years. and. <laughs> It's been um, very interesting to watch the um, the progress of the portfolio, uh, which, despite um, this year's returns, has has been pretty good over the long term. So anyway, um, I've been in the uh, business of trust banking, uh, which involves investment management for for people who uh, have long term plans. And I've been in that business for 37 years um, and find this particular challenge this year very interesting. I find myself very empathetic with people, but 
uh, with the fortunate uh, experience of seeing uh, the market over the long haul, like Mr. Bullock, um, uh, I, I, I really feel that uh, we're not in a bad position, even though um, we're not having a good year to date. Thank you, Chris. That's a nice note of optimism. Uh, Paul Horn, uh, who's not directly on the committee, but is our treasurer and very uh, dedicated. Thanks, that. Ellen. I'm, I'm Paul Horn. I'm the diocesan treasurer and I worship at St. Stephen's in Middlebury. Uh, let's say I've been treasurer now for a year uh, and been quite involved with a lot of the Thrive activities and I'm looking forward for the coming year with the new governance structure uh, also. And my background has principally been uh, accounting, finance, operational, CFO for commercial businesses for a number of years before I retired. Thank you. And I'll turn to Michael McCormick, our advisor. For introduction? Sure. Just We're just going to do a quick introduction. Yeah. So, yeah uh, and, and then I'll turn to you for your briefing. Gotcha. So Michael McCormick, um, 46, I, along with Bridget, myself, and another partner, we're the owners of Hickok and Borman Capital Management. I've been doing the asset management for 22 years and studied it since I was 14. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, it's been a challenging time. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but, you know, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Bridget? Good evening, everyone. I'm Michael's business partner, Bridget White, and I have been, um, I think, 28 years um, in the industry. And more to come. <laughs> Good. Don't, don't get discouraged. <laughs> Um, all right, let's turn briefly to our participants, Peter. Yeah, hi, I, I got an email a couple of weeks ago from um, the head of our, uh, I'm the treasurer at Cathedral Church St. Paul, and um, I was, um, got an email from uh, the head of our trustees, and uh I thought I'd see more of my people here, but I mean, you're, you're all my people, but um, I just thought I'd see people from St. Paul's here, but I'm here to collect info just to find out how, how things work here. Cause uh, we see your numbers every quarter when we meet and always curious how, how they come up. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Um, Anne Guillaume, I should have said earlier is a member of this committee and I think she's traveling today. Um, and um, may be able to call in, but I'm, I'm not sure. But I do know that she's traveling. So she would be, I know she's on the trustees of the cathedral. Uh, Chad? Yeah, I'm Chad Wolders. I uh, attend um, Christchurch Montpelier with Elizabeth and with Ellen. And uh, I've been on the Diocesan Finance and Audit Committee. And I have... Uh, no professional experience in finance whatsoever. Uh, I'm professionally a chemist, or at least I was. Um, so I'm here to, uh, to learn more stuff. Thank you, Chad. Darcy? Hi, I'm Darcy Mercier. I am the deacon at Grace Church in Sheldon, um, recently ordained from St. Michael's in Brattleboro. And I'm just here to learn. I um, saw the, on the diocesan website, I saw the, the meeting upcoming. So I just thought, oh, the newbie, I should learn. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Elizabeth? Hi, I'm Elizabeth Parker. I'm the treasurer at Christ Church. Once upon a time when diocesan council existed, <laughs> I was on diocesan council and also on the finance and audit committee. Um, I've had a little bit of background in investments, but I'm really interested. I know nothing about the unit fund, and I'm really interested in getting a grounding in that. Um, I've my hair is turning white. Well, no, I'm joking. I when I saw the drop um, from the uh, end of the first quarter, I was kind of, so I know it's not, hopefully it will rebound and we'll all sail forward, but I'd like to get a sense from you about what we can expect, but I'm into questions already, sorry. Okay, great. Well, I, I think Michael will cover that. And I just wanted to invite uh, 
Gal somebody Galbraith who joined us to introduce themselves. Yes, Peter Galbraith, um, former member of Diocesan Council and the Budget Committee, just here because I'm interested. All right, thank you. Um, so I'm sure we we want to get a grasp on the year and and get Michael's outlook in guiding us through these turbulent times. So Michael, I'm going to turn it over to you and any screen share that you would like to do. Okay, and thank you, Ellen. Um, so good evening and thank you again for having me. Uh, like I said, uh, um, we've been, well, let me, actually, let me say that we, we first started working the diocese in fall of 2006. Uh, that's when we were hired. Um, and we've been managing it since then. The investment committee makeup has changed much over the years as to, uh, so has the strategy. Maybe it was five or six years ago. I, I'm, you know, time is, uh, you know, a force that never seems to stop. So my memory may not be exactly correct, but five or six years ago, the investment committee set out uh, RFP to, to, to the marketplace and we, we won the business again. And, and at that time, how the, how the diocese and Unifund was managed changed and it was much more of let the experts do their job. That is my, myself, Bridget, and our whole team here of 10 people uh, versus the investment committee at that time having a big heavy hand and making the investment decisions. And since then, I think the results have been better. 2022 obviously has been a challenge. We'll get to that in a minute. Well, let me first start off by saying when we're talking about an entity like the, invest, like the Episcopal Diocese of Vermont, uh, I think it's good to remind uh, everybody, and I'm going to talk, obviously there's only a handful of people on this call, but my presumption will be that, well, I hope that in, uh, at some point after this is over with that people who maybe missed it do listen to us. I'm going to talk to a larger audience. Um, so it's important to remember that this, uh, the endowment fund uh, that, it, that we are managing, we view, and I think those involved view as an, ent as an asset and an entity that will outlive us all. This is ultra long-term capital. Um, this is capital that's going to be there for the very long term. And I'd like to start by uh, reading the gospel imperative that's on the investment policy statement to ground the conversation. I think it's a, it's a really good place to start. It says, we, the trustees of the Episcopal Diocese of Vermont, believe that our foremost, foremost gospel imperative is to be wise stewards of the resources under our care. Our first priority, therefore, is to ensure that diocesan investments provide a growing and sustainable source of disbursable funds over the long term. We also believe that diocesan resources can be a force for good in our world. Through our investments and actions, we seek to encourage corporate res social responsibility. Through targeted local investing, we seek to care for our neighbors. So the assets in the fund are designed and invested in, an, in a socially responsible way. And some of the components are specifically and, and intentionally included that are local investments. And I'll get to that in a second. But let me first start with, with, the, with the overall uh, structure of, of the assets. There are four accounts. Um, there is a bond account, stock account, small cap account, and a foreign account. So there are four accounts that comprise the, uh, the unit fund. Um, so at this time, and I'll well, at this time, the current makeup of the portfolio is roughly 74% to stocks and the rest is in a fixed assets. I'm going to share the screen. I want to get to the, this is the third quarter review that we sent out um, just recently. Now, I want to remind everybody uh, who's here or who's listening that all of the investment reviews are available as long, in addition, uh, the, the uh, investment policy statement is all available on the diocesan website. So all these reports you guys can see going back to uh, many years, roughly the beginning of each, well, it's probably more towards the middle of the month of a new quarter is when it will be published. This call that we're holding today happens once a year, or it's roughly once a year. So let's get into the into the into where we stand today, and I'll you know I've got a bunch of, of different sh uh, pages to go through, um, and so and then we can turn it over to questions. So we always start off well, where where are we where are we sitting? Third quarter, the account was down about, or the assets in the portfolio are down about four point seven percent. The benchmark, which is benchmark of assets that are simply split between the S and P five hundred index, which is the large cap U S index and the aggregate bond index, which is the U.S. bond index. It's a very simple measurement. It's a weighted average of those two based upon the allocation of the portfolio. The alternative benchmark is a benchmark more 
specific to how this portfolio is invested. So all the data here, you can see year to date, we're down about 25%. It's been a bad year. Past year, it's down about 20. Over time, you go further out and the results get significantly better. 2022 has been a significant challenge uh, for our for, for, for everybody. Now, I'll point out one of the fundamental reasons why. And I'm going to skip ahead to the current allocation. So currently, the, the stocks are roughly 74%. The rest of it, the fixed income, preferred, these are income-oriented assets. And with a portfolio split, the way we have it split, uh, it's appropriate for a long, ultra long-term investment plan. What it makes 2022 particularly unique from an investment perspective is that we have not had the typical ballast from our bond assets to help offset the decline in the stock market. So let's just do some simple math. If we have a portfolio that is split equally between stocks and bonds, 50% stocks, 50% bonds, we all know from investing that it is not unheard of for stocks to drop 20% in a year. It happens once every four or five years. When that happens, the bond side of the portfolio will rise, you know, call it 5%. So if you have a 20% loss on half, that's a negative 10. If you have a 5% gain on the other half, that's a positive two and a half. You put those two things together and you're down seven and a half percent. It's a very reasonable and stomachable decline in value. Um, this is not, that has not happened in 2022. 2022 is a year where bonds are down about 15%. So the, the, the normal 25% of the portfolio or 50% in my example has not done really anything to help stem the decline in assets. And we get to why in a second. So think about that 50-50 mix that a lot of my retirees have, a lot of people have that sort of a mix. If you're down 20 and you're down 15, you put it together, you're down 17.5%. That's very different than 7.5%. So 2022 has, has been obviously uh, been difficult in that regard. Now, why? So why is why are bonds declining like that? Why are stocks declining like that? Well, let's go back in time for a minute, uh, and let's let's go to what, what was going on. Let's say a year and a half ago. We all know what happened. COVID came. Uh, we locked down everything. Uh, we stopped producing. Uh, we also sent money out to people to not produce, and that was the nature of the beast that we had to deal with. Um, for Quite a while, the uh, Federal Reserve ha had a position that inflation wasn't going to be a significant issue, that it seemed to be transient. Um, it wasn't in retrospect. Uh, I think um, that they kind of made a pretty big mistake in that regard. It's easy to armchair quarterback uh, and have, you know, hindsight is 2020. Um, obviously, we have an inflation issue. We sit here today and, and when, when you have an inflation issue, the way you try to decrease in, the in, in inflation across an economy, and inflation, just so everybody understands, is the biggest tax on society, especially those at the lowest end of the economic spectrum. You know, where, uh, you know, going from $3.50 for a gallon of milk to $5, you do that when you've got a family, it's very difficult. And so the government's goal, the Federal Reserve's goal, rather, is to take inflation down and so, so that it does not continue to erode and tax society. The mechanism to do that is to decrease demand. They have no real, they can't influ influence the supply very much, but they can decrease the demand. And so they do that by raising interest rates. And when interest rates rise, the price of bonds goes down. So you've got a double issue. Inflation is eating away at the value of bonds and they're pushing up interest rates. And that's what's caused bonds to decline so significantly because the value of the currency is declining. So, and as interest rates rise, bonds decline in value, this inverse relationship. Stocks are essentially, when you look at, when I say stock, I want you to think of it as a company. When you invest in a company, you buy their stock, but you really own a very small piece of a very big business. We buy businesses for one reason, is that we believe that they're gonna be more valuable in the future. Why would they be more valuable in the future? The answer is that their earnings are gonna rise. Fundamentally, a company's value is, not, is worth nothing more than the discounted value of its future cash flows. 
So if Apple's going to make $10, a sh- I'm making it up, $10 a share every year for the next five years, well, what's that worth to us today? How do we discount that? And ultimately, the interest rate gets factored in. Well, what's the cost of capital? What's a reasonable risk to assign to a particular company? So when you have interest rates rising to try to slow an economy down, presumably you're going to have a decrease in earnings. And when a, co- when a company has a decrease in earnings, their value should be lower today. That's just basically what's going on. Um, so there's, and let me let me go through a couple other things right now. So can you all see this? Uh, this did it switch over? Yes. Okay. So sorry. So this is the, the current makeup of the of the diocesan fund as of yesterday. Um, so right now we're about seventy four percent in stocks. Now I want to point out a couple of things because of the nature of the social responsibility, we do not have any energy comp- any, any energy stocks at all. So that has hurt the portfolio. The portfolio has been harmed by not having that many of that on that side of, of the uh, investing spectrum has done really well, but we're, we're not buying those for different reasons. In places that we have more exposed to technology. So we're at 20 per, 28% of the portfolio is in technology versus the S&P of 22%. So we're a bit higher in technology, when you talk about what I was saying a minute ago about interest rates rising and slowing down an economy, technology tends to be hit harder when you have this sort of a, a, a dynamic where you have interest rates rising and potential earnings declining. Um, ultimately, I think though that is, you know, we have to replace the energy that we don't have with with something, and I think technology is going to help us with our energy crisis and our, um, you know, just how we how we run the world. We have a setback, and and I would argue that a significant portion of the harm that has been that the, that in this particular count or counts in general is because of the technology side of it. So they've just declined in value. But if we own good businesses with competitive positions, barriers to entry, then we're over time we're going to be okay. There's going to be periods of time where we are humble and we feel foolish, and I you know that's happened. I mean, it's great companies uh, have been thrown out. And that's where you get that, those sort of periods of time. Speaking of which, um, let me look at, let's, let me show you some of the word, how the market behaves after some bad periods of time. So let's, let's go all the way to the right. I find that this is, um, Bridget found this and this is great, good information. If we go back to, let's say, a really bad period like the fall of 2008, we probably all remember that one. That's recent enough. Uh, the S&P declined roughly 30% in that three-month period. A year later, the gain was 25%. 1987 was another really acute period. And then you have a bounce back. The point is that we're going to have declines, and we cannot begin to predict when they're going to happen with any great accuracy. We're not going to try to time the market. We believe in having, again, again for, a lo- for a long live portfolio, we want to have good businesses, and we want to own them for the long term. We cannot try to guess when is a good time to buy or when is a good time to sell. So there's definitely been a decline in the value. So here's, this is, I think you're going to find this very useful. This goes back to the very beginning of time when we started working with the diocese back in 2006. The green line represents the value of the portfolio over time. The blue line represents the withdrawals, net withdrawal. So we began and it was worth, I, I forget what the initial deposit was. And then over time, as we, as the diocesan um, IPS investment policy statement dictates, 5% of the portfolio is distributed every year. So the blue line is going to naturally decline to the extent that withdrawals exceed deposits. And you can see that they have. The green line represents the portfolio value. The distance between the blue and the green simply represents the gain. Uh, and at roughly 29 million, um, uh, you know, we and at, at that low line, let's say that's 7 million, we're still looking at a gain of, of what is that, uh, 22 million. So we've got some good gains over time. Now, obviously we hit, you know, everyone in your own world, probably you always remember, well, at what point, how you, you had the most money, the high watermark. So yes, we've had a decline. Uh, but if you look at over time, the portfolio has steadily, has steadily risen. Um, and that's what we want to see. We cannot predict the short-term moves and we're not going to try. Now, uh, as it relates to, you know, one of the more important aspects, um, and some um, 
someone had mentioned it uh, a minute ago about the portfolio, um, the, the, the uh, withdrawals that happen and, and the checks that you get. This is important to understand. Now that, that screen I just showed you with that green value that had that, had that big rise after COVID and then it peaked earlier, uh, actually about a year ago and has been in a decline. This is the method that is used to calculate how much each of those checks are every quarter. To keep it simple, basically what, we, what the methodology is that we look at the prior 12 quarters of the unit fund value. So for example, um, I'm gonna look at the current quarter. So September 30th of 2019, you did all the math and the unit fund is worth $11.51 per unit. And then you can see, well, March of 2020, we all remember that, we're all hiding in our rooms, not talking to anybody. Market didn't like that and it declined. Then we had a very steady increase in value each of these following quarters, and it ultimately peaked at the end of the year. Now it's gone back down and we're sitting here roughly at about 12 per unit. So the rate of, of, of dividend is 16 cents per unit. So in other words, if you've got X, X units invested in the, in the unit fund, you do the math and it's 16%, uh, 16 cents for each unit is paid out quarterly in a dividend. So the point of this is that these ups and downs are smoothed out. If we go back to like 9.87 and look at the dividend per unit, it didn't even change at, at the, you know, you have to push that, that decimal point out. It's going to smooth out the ups and downs and that's intentional. The, the, down, the, the result of that is that during Downward periods, the it, you, payments quarterly will decline over time, but it's going to be a much more gradual decline. And then when the when the market recovers and the portfolio recovers, the the increase uh, will also be smoothed out. It'll take a little while to show up. Like for example, if we're dramatic about it, and if some miraculously gets to eighteen, you can see that the dividend only goes up slightly. Let's hope that happens. Uh, well, that's actually looking backwards, but. Um, so that's an important aspect, I think, that, that people should keep in mind. Um, so let me, now let me go back to what the world might look like. So we have, again, like about 75% in stocks. The market has been down, and for the first time in a long time, we can actually buy good bonds. This is a bond that we bought, I bought in the account towards the end of the quarter. It's an A, where is it? The rating is an A minus by, by S&P, BAA1 by Moody's. That means high quality bond. It matures in two and a half years and the yield to maturity is 6%. So for the first time, and I, you know, it's been a number of years, we can finally get some decent returns on a going forward basis with capital. So we deployed a bunch of capital at the end of the quarter because we had, we had a significant level of cash, and I'm glad we did. It allowed us to go and buy, for two and a half years, the diocese is going to earn almost 6% on this bond until it matures per year. That's a good deal. So the 25% of the portfolio, as we look forward, should start to increase and in, in, should start to be additive to returns unless inflation sticks and it's more difficult to get a control of, and the Federal Reserve has to continuously raise interest rates, then bond prices are gonna to continue to come down. I don't think that's going to happen, um, but it's a risk. We're only at two and a half years on this. It's still, a, it's still a very good rate of return. Michael, you might make a comment on the preferred portfolio and the alternatives that you used through, except for straight out bonds, because you did a very good job on that side of the portfolio too. Yeah, the bond portfolio has done has held up really well um, relative to the index. In fact, over five years, we're head of head of the bond index. Um, we got there by um, being a bit more aggressive on some of of the of the fixed income assets, buying a, a type of assets called the preferred stocks. It's a it's a bit of a hybrid between a bond and a stock, but it functions and we view it very much like like a stock. Or I'm sorry, like a bond. Um, it's got higher yields. Um, and it's going to kick off a lot of cash flow, and that gives us the opportunity to go in and buy um, higher yielding bonds like we've just done. Um, so, you know, so overall, I think you know we've navigated the bond side of the of the, of the market better um, in terms of you know the com direct comparatives. 
on the stock side, you've got you know high quality assets that have declined in value. Um, you know, the U.S. stock market is down what twenty three percent on a year to date basis, um, and it presents opportunities. Um, sometimes the opportunities um, don't, you know, what seems like a good opportunity one day may become not one the next, or the opportunity is delayed. You know, because we don't always, you can't always tell. Um, you know, when things are going to turn around. And if we have seen peak inflation, and I think we have, and why I'm not as concerned on a going forward basis, look at what the returns are over the following periods of time. Let's go, let's say more contemporary. Let's say, I don't know, 1990, you, ha you had uh, the next 12 months after peak inflation, stocks rose 20%, bonds rose 14. March of 1980, 40% versus, and, and then bonds rose 13. Now we got one anomaly here in peak July 2008, and we all know the credit crisis happened. Their stocks did decline; they continued to decline. That was for other reasons than inflation, but bonds held up well. The average of it, after you hit peak inflation, the return is 21% on stocks for the next year, and bonds make seven. So your 50/50 portfolio, if you put those together, is 14% gain. A portfolio like you guys have with three quarters and one quarter, you know that's going to be somewhere in the 17 and a half percent range. Um, those are good returns. Uh, so the market's uh, been challenging. Uh, we, I believe that we're positioned well. Now, I want to touch on um, the local side of it. So, you know, part, part of uh, the um, gospel imperative that I read was to have an impact locally. It's difficult. You know, we're in the public sector in terms of what we can buy. We can buy publicly traded stocks. We can't. Sorry, Michael, could you take yeah. down the screen share just so we can all see each other. Thank you. Sure. Sorry. Yeah. So the um, we're in the public sector, so we have to buy publicly traded companies. We can't go out and and with the diocesan unifund and go invest in, you know, I'll make it up like, uh, I don't know, dealer.com when they were private. I mean, they've always been private. Um, so we have to live within the within the what's available publicly. In the state of Vermont, there's only a couple of companies that are located here. We we've bought so, but there are there have been companies that have been located here that we can buy, um, and but they were acquired by a larger entity. For example, Ben and Jerry's. Unilever bought Ben and Jerry's. It seems like eons ago. So we own Unilever. So I'll just name some of the companies that are in that are, have that local impact. Um, iSun Corporation, which is in the alternative energy side. Unilever, uh, Vail Mountain Resorts. We all know that they own Stowe, and I think another place in Southern Vermont, I think. Um, Agilent, they bought biotech instruments uh, a year and a half, two years ago, something like that. Keurig Dr. Pepper, they bought Green Mountain, basically the owner of Green Mountain Coffee Roasters. Um, Union Bank, um, we've got, and the last one is Casella Waste. Casella is a great, greatly run, greatly managed, well-managed uh, company, local company. So that's how we can, uh, um, adhere to the gospel imperative on the impact investing. Um, so I think at this point, I've, I've tried, I think I've delivered most of the comments I, and I know there'll be lots of questions. So I, I think maybe, maybe Alan, let's turn it back to you. I'll turn it back to you for questions. Yeah. Um, thank you, Michael. I think you really covered a lot and I want to make sure that, um, I mean, I know our committee is very interested, but I want to, I want to make sure that um, our attendees from um, the various um, churches have a chance to ask questions or raise any issues that are on your mind. And, and please don't hesitate to ask um, what you might think would be a simple question, you know, about how the unit fund works or how you get into it or the impact on your church or anything. <laughs> I'll go. Sure, Peter. Thank you. Um, a discussion um, in the trustees at the cathedral has often revolved around um, how the diversification of the unit fund is um, pretty heavily weighted to American holdings versus potentially lessening some of the possible risk of being in just one pot and maybe not having more international or more developing countries, et cetera. Um, just wondering how um, how that strategy was was um, um, come to. So when um, 
when five or six years ago, when we, we took over at, to make, to really be the ones making the investment decisions, we had a higher level of, of foreign exposure. Um, as we've gone forward uh, since then, we've decreased the foreign exposure to you know, re relatively a very small amount. And we've actually been talking about, um, about, about eliminating it. This is not a, a huge position. And I'm glad we don't have a huge position in it because the results, the returns have been, um, you know, uh, pretty lousy. Uh, the, the foreign index for five years is negative 0.84%. Um, the, the U.S. stock markets is 9.24%. So it's very deliberate to, to avoid the foreign markets. When you're talking about a foreign investment, um, you've got a couple of other issues, not, not just the India the company specific risk that you might face if you own a share of, you know, a I'm making it up a company that that's in Paris, you know, they may or may not have a good business, certainly a lot more difficult trying to ascertain whether or not they do. Um, and for, our, you know, the foreign account, we actually have outsourced the, the management of that to, to someone else, because we're just not going to, we're not going to go that we're not going to spend our time trying to understand 75 different foreign companies. So you've got the company specific risk associated with it. Secondly, another layer of risk, you've got a uh, geopolitical risk. You never know what the politics in, in France will be in this example. Uh, the third is you have a currency risk. The euro is going to fluctuate one way or the other. The U.S. dollar has been extraordinarily strong and as a direct result of raising interest rates. When you raise interest rates, you attract capital. If To the extent that your interest rates are higher than the, your neighbors, then they're going to have flows. They're going to sell their euros, they're going to buy dollars. So ultimately, with a strong dollar, the conversion, it, it makes it difficult to make money. You might make money on your investment in France, um, but the currency change may take it all away. Um, so, you know, at some point, though, Peter, I think it will, it could flip back the other way. Valuations in Europe are significantly lower. When I, see, when I say valuations, I'm talking about the price over earnings multiple. It's the most basic metric we look at. What's the price of a stock or a market divided by the earnings of that stock? or the market. Um, US stocks are trading around 16 times earnings. I'm gonna guess, and I haven't looked at it in a while, that uh, the PE ratio of the foreign markets is something like nine or 10 or 11. It's, it's quite quite a bit less. And that, okay, on, on the surface of it, you might say, wow, hey, that looks like a good deal. Um, the issue that investors face when they, when, they, when they make a decision based upon a simple metric like that is, well, there must be a reason why. And that is because earnings and the economy is just not as strong. So their earnings aren't growing. Um, so we've largely avoided the foreign markets, and, and Bridget and I have talked about, and, and I've spoken with the investment committee. I mean, don't be surprised if one day we don't have it, at, at, we don't have it at all until it looks better. Um, yeah. Now, I think you have our turn. support for that. Excuse me. I think you have our, our support okay. for that. <laughs> yeah. So that, that may, they may come, uh, and it may come that we go back the other way. We're not, like I said, we're not market timers. I'm just looking at long-term numbers and I'm thinking, well, almost 10% a year for five years in the S&P and negative 0.8 in foreign. Now, maybe that means it's a great time to buy it. You know, and, and there lies the question. Uh, uh, I'm Michael, sorry, there, just... There's one other, other thought that you might add in there. The, the companies that we have in the portfolio are some of the largest and richest global competitors in the world. True. So it's not as if we don't have uh, international exposure with them. When you're talking about Apple and Amazon and Google, they are global competitors and a good portion of their income and revenue is from abroad. And we don't have to, as owners of those companies, we don't have to get into the currency situation. We don't have to be stock pickers on a local level. So we're not, not immune completely to gaining some of the benefit internationally. We just felt that staying closer to home is a safer bet. Yeah, and it also fits our policy statement. Great, who else? Chad, Elizabeth, Darcy, Peter? Jay, did you, did you have something to add to that, Chad? No, that was what David said. And, oh, gosh, and okay. Investment policy, so gotcha. good thinking. Anybody else have questions, comments? I don't have any questions or comments at this time, but some may percolate up. I'm an introvert. It's going to take me a while to digest all of this, and I may watch the video again and uh, 
and just to get a second, uh, you know, input here. But thank you very sure. much. It's very clear. Uh, so one okay. one last comment that I I might make on this is that this. Michael, you should talk about the long-term portfolio aspect, because what we strive to do is buy the best businesses that are available that will have the lo best long-term pers perspective in the world. And I think we've, we've, we've hit that um, ball pretty well. Yeah, that's true. And, and so I'll, looking at from the initial purchase point, our top 10 holdings, um, there's only two that have a, a negative position and they were recently added. So let me just tell you the largest positions, the top 10, Apple Computer or Apple Incorporated, Broadcom, which is a semiconductor manufacturer, Google, we all know Google is, Microsoft, Home Depot, Edwards Life Sciences, and it's, on, it's in the medical side, Advanced Micro device, Devices, they make microchips, Amazon, uh, Qualcomm, J&J. Yeah, that's the top 10. So it's actually three. So we're marginally down in J&J. &J. We're down 8 10% in advanced micro and uh, Qualcomm has been a big disappointment. But it, that, that's a good example of a high quality asset that I think is misunderstood or perhaps just value is not being properly reflected. It trades at like 10 times earnings. So that P over E we're talking about, there's it like, uh, two thirds of what the market multiple is. That's a that's a good value, and it's a great company, and they're growing earnings, and they're in a competitive place. I firmly believe that over the next decade, what companies like those, Qualcomm and microchip makers, te technology in general, is going to do. Think about what has happened over the prior ten. I think it's and it's an exponential sort of thing when you talk about technology and its impact it has. Hopefully, most of the impact is good. Maybe I feel like sometimes when my kids are on their damn things, I feel like it isn't, but uh, that's a different topic. Um, one thing I wanted to mention uh, as it relates just to the, the, the um, house, you know, the day-to-day -day operations of it, just so in case anybody doesn't understand this and anybody who's listening, who's not here, uh, it's an important point to make. Inflows and outflows to the unit fund happen only four times a year. If there is an end in one of the parishes that wants to make a contribution they can, if today's October 17th, they can send the funds to Rich at the diocese uh, home office. Uh, and, you know, he'll, he'll send it to us right away, but it'll sit in a cash account until January 2nd. Okay, that's the very first trading day of the new quarter. At that point, it gets added and you are now in an, an additional investor if, if, if you're new or you have more shares, if you already have some at uh, that moment. That same day, is when any outflows will be will be sent out. So if today is October 17th and one of the parishes said, I want $10,000 on January, I want $10,000 now, our answer is we can give it to you on January 2nd. So I have to have, you have to have a little bit of, um, if there's a need, a capital need, you've got to plan it out a little bit. Um, and I think with some reasonable planning, that shouldn't be a challenge. Uh, you know, one of the advantages, there's many, maybe there are many parishes that that do this on their own. I don't know. Um, but, you know, just to, to make a commercial, I mean, for ourselves, it, you know, we are able to bring to the diocese institutional wealth management, uh, and we have incredible resources that are behind us, and I'm pretty sure uh, that over the longer term that the results are going to like, they're going to be, they're likely to be better in this industry, I can never say for sure, because I just don't, you know, I can't predict the future, um, but when you when you're looking at um, the investing world, uh, there is, and, and you study economics, some, there's something that's called economies of scale. When you have a lot of people uh, together and one, you know, and doing one thing and they do it well, usually the results are better than everyone else. Everyone trying to. That's why we don't all have tomato plants in our backyard, or maybe we do, but you know, we all go to the store and we buy food. We don't produce it ourselves. When you put things together, you get better economies. And I would argue that. Um, you know, 2022, like I said, has been challenging, but over the longer term, I'm very confident in what we've done. And I, I believe we're very well positioned that when we're sitting here a year from now, um, that we're in a better, simply better position. I hope so. Thank you, Michael. I'm so glad you said that because I do believe that the aggregating of all these funds puts everybody in a stronger position. 
Right. And thank you, Anne Bridget, for your very, really, very clear explanations. Are there any final questions or comments before I uh, liberate us all for our dinner times? Just yeah, a quick I comment. That, uh, I think Michael's perspective is excellent and greatly appreciated. Thank, thank you. you, Peter. Yeah, Bridget. The, the other comment that I'll just add is talking about the aggregation, um, the cost effective, effectiveness of this program is. I'm sure far better than um, dioceses are able to do on their own. So that's just another right. little. That's yeah, right. that's a good point because we're we're buying individual companies, individual bonds. We're not buying a mutual fund that has layers of expenses upon on top on top of which is another advisory fee. So will you go and go, go out and buy the shares? That's a good point, Joe. Yeah, very good point, Sarah. Helen, if I could add just a couple of points, or really just to summarize, uh, I think it's very important that the parishes and other investors in the in the unit fund understand that 12 quarter average dividend flow, which Michael pointed out, but it really does smooth out the dividends that, that we disperse to the parishes for their income that they depend on quarter in and quarter out. And uh, it has made a big difference to be able to have predictability at the uh, parish level, if you will, for the income that you receive uh, through the dividend flow. And yes, given where things are today and over the past year, um, at some point that 12 quarter average could be less than it is right now, but it's actually higher this quarter than it was last quarter. So right now the parishes continue to benefit from that rolling quarter average, I guess you could say. And the other point I just want to make sure that we that we remember is the investment policy is a socially responsible investment policy. And we've adopted the uh, essentially the policy of the Episcopal Church of the United States. So uh, this is something that's been very important to us as trustees. Um, and as Dave Michael pointed out as well, it's why we don't have investments in energy companies because these are not on the national church's buy list, if you will. So uh, I think it's important that we all remember um, who we are and what our mission is um, when we look at the investments that we're doing. Thank you. And thank, and, and thank you, Michael and Bergette. We have very uh, regular um, meetings and conversations with them. And it's been, they've, they've provided wonderful support to us. Yeah, and, and just Elizabeth, getting specific to you, um, the, um, if you have questions, I mean, you know, we're available. Uh, and I, every once in a while, I do talk to parishes specifically. Um, so if you got questions, you know, it's no, I have none, Bridget or I will have no problem spending half an hour on a phone or whatever it takes to, to, to clear, clear any of the questions. Um, Elizabeth has asked a question about uh, having each page of the quarterly unit fund have the year and quarter noted at the bottom of the sheet. Uh, is that the the dividend? What which sheet are you talking about? So there, typically in our parish, at least, we receive three sheets. There's a cover sheet, and then there's the mm -hmm. actual um, what we have uh, invested, and then another. And um, so each sheet doesn't have the quarter and and uh, year. And it's a very simple and mundane request, but it would make no, life easy. easier. Because no I problem. Have, it's some pages which have gotten mixed up. So sure. Easy. going forward. Yeah. But I, I appreciate your saying that. I don't anticipate that I will have any questions, but I'm happy that you're um, doing this. And I look forward to, uh, you know, I don't know how often uh, the committee is planning on having you speak to us, but I would be happy to be at the next meeting and just hear your evaluation of what's going on. It helps us to um, you know, feel informed and uh, responsible. So thank you. You know, Elizabeth, that's a nice idea. I think if things, especially if things continue to be as challenging as they are, um, we might um, just want to 
do this again for people who are concerned. And I think yeah, David, I, you had a you had a last comment to wrap us up. I, I didn't mean it to be the last comment, Ellen, but I you know on a relative basis, the cost to manage this fund, the fees that we are paying out are extremely low and extremely attractive, which means that more of your money stays in the pool and keeps working for you. And that's one of the things that we look at quite a lot is what our fees are for turnover costs and fees to our third party manager, which we believe are uh, very, very favorable. That's going yeah, back yeah. to Michael's point of economies of scale. Yeah. yeah. And, and by the way, as part of the, the cost to hire us is we do all of the account statement preparation, things that we don't do for others. It goes far beyond you know, deciding how to allocate a portfolio and where to place risk. Uh, there's a lot of housekeeping things that go on in the background. Uh, I mean, the yeah, we have a whiz here. He's a whiz. And he, yeah. you know, a lot goes into it. And that's all part of the expenses. Yeah, you're doing all the calculations and statements on the DUT fund. It's yeah. great. Greatly appreciated. And thank you, Sarah, for your excellent points. Um, I'm going to suggest that we adjourn. And I um, am very grateful for everyone's participation and um, hope very much that others in other churches will watch um, the recording so that they're also well informed. Yeah, and I would just like lastly publicly say thank you to the investment committee and the diocese. We are a small firm and this is our biggest account and it means the most to us. And the, the, the faith and trust that, that, that is, has been instilled upon us is uh, we take it very seriously. And we're doing the absolute best we can. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, thank you to the committee and uh, to you for coming, Michael and uh, Brigitte. Uh, it was wonderful. Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Good night. Okay, good night, everybody. Be well.